Well, I'd like to uh, give a warm greeting from Geneva, Switzerland, the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, and the Global Surgery Foundation. Uh, we're quite pleased to be hosting this wonderful uh, webinar with some great speakers today. And just as we uh, wait for some of the participants to be signing on, I just want to welcome everybody and especially <clears throat> a warm welcome to our co-sponsors, uh, Operation Smile, uh, University of Cape Town, Tribudan University, and Nepal Medical Council, uh, where a lot of our, our speakers are coming from. So we're very happy to uh, be hosting this webinar, Leading Health Systems Through the COVID-19 Pandemic. And so, uh, Kate, I'd like to hand it over to you. Thank you very much for moderating this session. This is the second session we've done with Operation Smile. And Kate did a wonderful job in moderating last time, so we wanted to recruit her again. So take it away, Kate. Thank you very much. And uh, we look forward to having this great webinar. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. So I'm Dr. Kate Talenko. I'm a pediatrician and I'm uh, currently serving as a senior advisor for uh, Operation Smile. And Operation Smile for almost 40 years has increased access to essential surgery, surgery through the lens of cleft palate and uh, cleft lip repair. And uh, we've been organizing these webinars with the Global Surgery Foundation and, and UNITAR in order to help our partner hospitals in over 30 countries to respond to the, the COVID outbreak. And the COVID outbreak is certainly the, the biggest leadership challenge for health systems and hospitals uh, of the century. And not only is it uh, a leadership challenge, but it, it goes across all domains of leadership. It's an HR challenge, a communications challenge, a financial challenge, and in many ways, a, a trust challenge. And so we've organized this meeting today to get some great speakers who can talk to you about how you can change leadership uh, really across all these elements and change leadership at the systems, the team, and the individual level. And so I would like to introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Professor Norman Fall, and he is a Emeritus Professor of Operations Management at the School of Business, University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, and his academic career has consisted of research in operations management and operations management strategy and implementation. And he currently serves on the JICA Kaizen Africa Award Committee. And uh, Professor Fall is uh, founder and chairman of LEA, the Lean Institute Africa <laughs> organization and member of the Global Lean Network. And LEA promotes effective use of lean in improving competitiveness and service delivery across many industries, including healthcare. And a key emphasis of the past uh, uh, several decades of Professor Norman's work has been applying lean to public se sector healthcare. And what he's gonna to talk to us today is about some work that he's been doing recently to organize a CEO roundtable during the COVID outbreak, as well as work he's done on improving management in, uh, in OBGYN uh, uh, facilities. So Professor Fall. Thanks, Kate. Thanks very much for that uh, introduction. Um, are you going to be showing my slides? Oh, there we go, thank you. So uh, as Kate has uh, introduced me, I have links with both the Graduate School of Business at the University of Cape Town, and I'm the founder and chair of the Lean Institute Africa. So uh, next slide, please. I've been involved in uh, researching, teaching, working in organizations for over 40 years. And uh, uh, one insight has struck me repeatedly the day-to-day -day operations are managed through firefighting. It's the most common uh, denomination of most organizations. And my 17 years uh, working with hospitals hasn't shown anything particularly different from that. Next slide, please. So what can we do with leading health systems through the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, what operations can we do differently? So this idea of a fortnightly Zoom meeting to crowdsource solutions came up right at the beginning of the South African experience. Next slide, please. So the gentleman, the gentleman on the right, Rob Campbell, is someone I've worked with for four or five years now. 
He has, he is the CEO of a, of a healthcare group with 12 hospitals here in South Africa called the Nurture Care Group. And I've shown you the, the website at the foot of that page. And he got hold of me early in April, shortly after our lockdown started and said he was going to be faced with, was being faced with and would be faced with a whole lot of problems as the uh, virus load increased. And was there a chance of, of crowdsourcing? So someone puts forward a problem and a whole lot of other people try to contribute to that much in the way as, as crowdfunding would provide funding for someone with a, a good idea. So this was someone with a good problem, crowdsourcing solutions. Next slide, please. So this is something that started uh, towards the end of April and there's been a fortnightly meeting ever since then. When we started the, the national daily infection rate in South Africa was less than 150 a day. A month ago, it was around 13,000 a day. The average over the past seven days has been around 3,000 and I'm pleased to say it's, it's falling quite steadily. Uh, we at the Lean Institute have hosted and chaired the meeting. There have been 12 to 20 people on each call. Some of them individual practitioners, but some of them CEOs of health facilities. So quite a range of, of people. Um, the, the meeting decides its own topics and it's very much a council of equals, people contributing uh, as they can. Next slide, please. So what are the key insights? The, the most significant one is the one I state right up front. Freedom is in the discipline. I'll come back to that one again and again. A second quote from a few weeks ago was, doctors need humility in this situation. Everyone is on a learning curve no one's got a complete solution. Doctors to whom people look uh, for authority and insight need to practice humility if their institution is to uh, protect itself and protect those it cares for. Equally important is that clarity of communication is mission critical to dealing with the pandemic. The, the Nurture Health Experience, it takes place within their lean management system that they've been putting in over the last three or four years, characterized by a CEO who goes to the front line, asks open-ended questions, doesn't do a lot of telling, connects people with purpose. The use of visual management boards so that there can be daily huddles around real data. Nurture Health has also had weekly so-called town hall meetings where it connects all 12 facilities to a, a Zoom meeting in which there can be uh, a briefing as to the status and to any specific learnings or problems. Very important to the overall sense of management. Sorry, can we go back to that previous slide? Thank you. Um, and then just finally, but very strongly connected to freedom is in the discipline, is the role of standard work as a basis for new protocols. So as these meetings have progressed, it's become so clear, and I think the, the lessons in North America I'm aware of have been similar, that where hospitals have a strong commitment to consistent use of uh, best practice, a standard work, there's a good basis for the new protocols required to deal with the virus. Next slide, please. So just some um, more general points. Um, uh, we, we like the fact that one of the hospitals was using the analogy of the chain and that each link is a staff member 
and the chain protecting the hospital, the staff, the patients from the virus was only as strong as its weakest link. So calling on each person to be committed and careful. Simple things like the tea room or other communal spots in the hospital where staff congregate as being a hotspot for the transfer of the virus. Staff transport to and from the place of work being a high risk area. Dealing with staff fear and anxiety. And I think that's where the freedom is in the discipline uh, comes in. That uh, where staff know that their colleagues are very disciplined in using best practice and standard work, the fear and anxiety is reduced. But of course, it remains a really difficult issue to manage. And then the, uh, I'm sure you're all aware of this, the idea of creating zones within the hospital and having protocols by zone. Next slide, please. So the conversations in these fortnightly meetings constantly come back to staff and the need for thorough training. Uh, a week spent training people on hand washing, another week spent training people on PVE. People being trained so that they are competent and then being trained in order to train others. The need to go with staff to observe and record the current condition in a situation, to agree a target condition, to then work together to identify obstacles that lie between the current and the target, and uh, to do that with wide eyes and real realism, then agree countermeasures and act swiftly. Uh, the speed of decision making has clearly accelerated as people have dealt with the virus. Next slide, please. So finally, just this photograph of a visual management board uh, in the time of the virus at one of the nurture health facilities. Um, the, you can see the symbolic chain on the visual management board reminding everybody that the chain is only as strong as the weakest link. Uh, we see here the listing of who has been trained and who is able to train others. Here is the checklist for self-screening, very much a case of don't wait for symptoms. Um, understand self-screening all the time and, uh, sorry, don't wait for a test. Make decisions based on symptoms. Here are the protocols for three different zones. Probably the most important aspect is this golden colored sheet which is entitled Problems Are Gold, in which the group in a daily huddle would identify problems, uh, identify possible countermeasures, who would take them on and reporting back. But I like the fact that it's, it's entitled Problems Are Gold. If people can talk about what is going wrong or what potentially could go wrong, one's got the opportunity to be proactive Fear must not drive people into a, a, a silence. And final slide, please. So we need to replace firefighting with disciplined routines. The, the freedom from anxiety will come through discipline. Uh, I just refer you to that article. Um, interestingly, the, the lessons are very much along the lines of what I've just shared with you. And if you have difficulty of, uh, tracing that, um, just send me an email and I'll send you a copy. You can see my, my email address at the foot of that slide. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Fall. I found it particularly interesting to see the, the visual management boards because I think one challenge of this crisis, because we've all been having to socially isolate management can often be invisible. 
and you know people at the on the front lines taking care of patients often aren't sure what management leadership are doing and this type of board makes it quite visible and also at a time where people are overwhelmed with information reading too much the fact that it's it's graphic it's visual makes it very easily absorbed and, and very easily remembered so i think that's a, an excellent yeah. example so our next speaker is dr bhagawan kerala and he's a cardiac surgeon from nepal who completed his training in ukraine bangladesh the US and Canada. And he's a member of the uh, European Society of uh, Carathic Surgeons, the Society of Carathic, uh, Thoracic Surgeons, and is a fellow of the American, Cardi uh, American College of Cardiology. And Dr. Kerala basically introduced um, uh, cardiac surgery to Nepal and has been a pioneer in making it accessible uh, to, uh, to many people throughout um, Nepal. And I think one thing that's very unique about Dr. Krala's leadership experience is that he has leadership experience both at the executive level in hospitals and in clinics, but also with professional associations uh, leading the, um, the Nepal Medical Council. And Dr. Krala has also been awarded the highest civilian honor for excellence in service in Nepal, and has also been um, awarded um, manager of the year by the Management Association of Nepal. So without further ado, Dr. Kerala. Yeah, thank you, Kate, for that uh, introduction. <clears throat> uh, it's been an honor to be part of this um, interesting and important webinar. And um, I thank everybody who organized this, including Jeff, for doing this. Um, yes, I um, am a, you know, still a clinical um, doctor and I do practice on an everyday basis, but uh, but the way it was set up right from the beginning, when I came back, I had to lead an institution to be able to practice my own speciality. That's how I, I got into this administrative role and then eventually take part in some of the policy work at, at, uh, at the ministry level most of the time. And I like doing some of this public health work, but not leaving my own clinical work of doing heart surgeries uh, even today. So I'm, I'm the head of cardiothoracic and vascular surgery department at the university, which is the only and the premier institute in Nepal. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. And uh, my topic, as you can see, is leading through at the individual level, institutional and policy. It's kind of hard to, to connect all those dots, but I'll try to just share what, uh, what uh, we've been doing here and how are we trying to um, sail through this this difficult time uh, when the system itself is already uh, so much in strain to begin with. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, if you look at the numbers, I'm not going to go into details of numbers. These numbers probably would look similar to many other countries. Um, you know, but interestingly, we had the first case in January. And for next two months, uh, there was no uh, second case in Nepal, uh, probably uh, because we locked down early on, banned the international travel early on, and uh, we, we tightened the borders uh, from all around uh, pretty early on. I think that helped um, prevent a lot of transmission in the beginning. But, but as of you know, 25th of August, you could see uh, the numbers are going up. Uh, we run in... Uh, uh, 30, 33,000 some cases now and um, 160 some cases deaths. Uh, worrisome thing is that we have about um, 300 cases daily in Kathmandu Valley itself. So that's uh, that's a little concerning now. Uh, and we have some more issues to deal with. I can briefly touch upon those. Um, and now, you know, the initial days when I remember, we, we are a landlocked country as all of you know. And when the international travel was banned, uh, transport wasn't working. So it become very stressful for healthcare workers, ourselves, and even for regular supplies at times, because most of the supplies had to come from outside. Uh, so even the medical supply fell short. Uh, it became a pretty, uh, pretty stressful moment at that time. And there was a big panic in the medical community and also in the public. And we had a lot of, uh, strain between this regulatory agency, which I currently hate, how do we handle this situation? And there was a newly, you know, uh, instituted constitution in Nepal, which, you know, gave birth to three tiers of governments. And we had not been practicing this system for a long time. And there was a little bit of confusion who is supposed to do what 
in terms of the federal government versus the provincial and the local level, which, which kind of quickly got fixed. But, you know, these are the things that we had to face with when you deal with a pandemic, which is in itself is a moving target, as you can understand. Uh, Julie? Next. Now, the first reaction, as, as everybody else, uh, we, we went, you know, what is this? I mean, how are we going to respond to this? Knowing how the health system in our country is, uh, so what are we going to do if something like in Wuhan happens or in Italy happens? And, you know, all we could do at that time was um, trying to consolidate our own team at the, the cardiothoracic center and maybe talk to our teaching hospital you know, train people again, as, as a professor said before, uh, take the IPC precautions, slow down on elective cases. Uh, we freed up some of the space for possible outbreaks early on, which luckily did not happen. So we had a lot of time then to, to prepare uh, ourselves, other hospitals and the country. We started working on stockpile, as I said before. It is not as in most of the countries, we, we really suffer if the borders become blocked off and, and and there is really no supply from other sites except for indian border so we have a lot of uh, strain in supplies as soon as we start locking the borders and nothing comes from south side from north side uh, it's it's a very difficult terrain and uh, sometimes the roads are open from china but but that most of the time does not work so these were the initial experiences that we faced but then we started preparing our own staff, the medical community, through the professional organizations, and, and so on and so forth. That's, that's at our local level. Next. Well, I chair the Nepal Medical Council, which is also support, supposed to regulate the practice of medicine in Nepal, actually look after the ethical practices of all doctors in Nepal. So it's kind of a pretty, pretty difficult and big job um, and especially in the times like this, uh, you have a lot of things to consider. And uh, that's the next thing that I started consolidating and focusing on. Um, we, we have the government in, in uh, bringing expert opinions as to what might be the right timing, how do we go about the transport restrictions and stuff. So Medical Council took a lead role in in influencing the government's decision in, in terms of how to go about it. There are, you know, the disease control center uh, in itself, but somehow they were all lagging behind in decision making. So we had to take that lead in, in the first place. And, um, you know, we again brought in a lot of experts trying to take lead to help the Ministry of Health to adopt certain IPCs, clinical case management guidelines, and a number of other guidelines that we normally don't have to do. Uh, but then this time around, we had to beat the time. And I think uh, council um, went a little beyond his regular job, regular duty to, to do these guidelines and have the government uh, to make certain decisions on time. And I think that did a pretty, pretty useful job, especially in controlling the infection for a few, four or five months. And then we started facing the situation of you know, uncontrolled border passages, uh, a lot of illegal or, you know, the, the unregistered returnees from India started com coming and we started having this first spike of returnees, which went way up in terms of number of infections. We also have the government in uh, developing the reopening guidelines and, and see how can we move forward trying to normalize things. And unfortunately, uh, we did reopen about a month ago and uh, the number of cases started going up because of a number of reasons. You know, also because the movement started going up, then now it is the end of first week that we're already uh, locked down again uh, for, for this week uh, because the number of cases uh, again started rising up steeply. Uh, next. We also, well, I, I, I am involved in, as I said before, I like to do some policy works and do public health. So I'm connected to some of the non profit organizations who work in public health, children's health. So again, mobilize those um, organizations to help um, have the frontline workers in the early days with supplies to education and trying to encourage those people and also work with the professional organizations like Medical Association, which is a um, professional body of all the doctors in Nepal, cardiac society, 
um, and trying to talk to them, uh, encouraging them, giving them confidence, um, and, uh, and also worked with the Medical Education Commission, which is newly formed now, trying to figure out how do we, you know, uh, do these national regulations on these education policies. So, you know, work through those organizations, helped a little bit on that. Hopefully we could influence the initial strain psychology of doctors and healthcare workers and trying to give them confidence that we can, we can sail through this pandemic. Next. At the same time, you know, um, as I said before, our medical council took a lead role in trying to uh, make decisions in the early days, trying to help them develop guidelines. Um, we, we continuously work with the Ministry of Health, which normally we don't do. As I said before, we have the only regulatory function with the doctors and licensing. But we also worked with the provincial governments, again, try and bring those two tiers of government together and try and help them uh, get the supplies, uh, arrange those ahead of time, give them the list of preparations that they need to do, um, and, and also discuss on some of the possible international collaborations on how do we improve the qualities of lab and maybe expansion of the lab services and so on and so forth. So I think uh, we had to go beyond the boundaries of the government scope uh, to, to try and work from different fronts and trying to help the frontline workers in any way that's possible. Uh, again, you know, this is one of the examples. You can just stay in this slide, there's no problem. Uh, example that we worked through a lot of debates and discussion trying to settle on those testing guidelines because we had a lot of difficulty getting the testing facilities in the beginning. We really didn't have, uh, you know, RT-PCR in the beginning and we had to send it out. But then over a period of time, we've got now 43 RT-PCR labs and then we do like you know, 15,000 some tests a day, which is uh, quite a progress over the last several months. And, uh, you know, we, we do face, um, uh, still face a lot of challenges in the country where the health system in itself is so imperfect to begin with, hospitals are not strong, number of beds are limited, the number of critical care beds are limited. So we were working really, really hard to keep the number of infected people down to begin with and we went very aggressive. And I think the government did the right thing to do with the lockdowns and travel restrictions and the increasing the testing facility in the beginning. That kept all these numbers to a reasonably low level for the last six months. But as I said before, due to a number of reasons and probably uh, poor understanding at a very community and then you know, uh, general public level, the number of cases are going up. Now the challenge is, how do we address the needs for bed and treatment and all the supplies? Uh, our system is already uh, pretty strained. Uh, so that's the, that's the challenge. One of the challenges we still face is uh, is the communication skills. I'll show you some of the examples and in next slide. Um, this is a difficult situation for everyone, everywhere. But but how do we communicate right things to people uh, from the ministry to health institutions and to the community? The education level is so low. The practice of standards is so um, you know easily broken into you know broken so it's it's always difficult to communicate to people and sometimes because of the changing decisions uh, the inconsistent decisions at a higher level makes it a little more complicated for people to understand what is going on and we understand that the the decisions also change because number of new findings come in over the last six months there have been number of new guidelines new protocols for hospitals and 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 so and so forth so it becomes very complicated for most people to understand those things. I'm showing some of the examples how the ministry sends directives and how people don't understand this and it's huge panic starts among the healthcare workers sometimes and in the public at times. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult time. Disease itself is a moving target. Timeliness and accuracy of decisions are sometimes not seen and the communication skills are pretty limited and, and risk communication in itself is a big big, big challenge. And that's where we also come into picture because then we can talk to people directly through different channels, media, and, and maybe individual level trying to explain those things. And experts have to do that at times. Um, and make people believe in what the government is saying is right and, and, and something worth following. And in the resources are variable. So your work is 
flound your seems floundering because your test kits are not available. Um, your treatment, you know, facilities and the supplies are not easily available. So a lot of issues coming together, and still we face the same, you know, similar problems once in a while. And and there are socioeconomic perspective on issues, and people take it differently in terms of how you go about the cost of care of this big pandemic when most of the time historically Nepal had about 50% of the healthcare cost coming out of pocket. Now government is trying to do all of this. So how do you handle all that? So these are the big issues at, at a policy level. And I see there are a number of challenges, um, you know, working at a policy level, which, which the ministry feels and we trying to help them, we feel as well. Next. Well, I mean, you can see some of the examples how this communication becomes very difficult. The healthcare workers, uh, you know, are sometimes depicted as if they they are not addressing the problems um, in the beginning, in the front line, and there is a lot of resentment from the public in terms of, oh, you know, they need to attend to the people early on. If anybody dies, there can sometimes be violence in the institutions, and you know, it becomes a big challenge for us. How do we? convince people that these things happen and you got to keep, you know, calm. At the same time, encourage healthcare workers, doctors to be bold enough to, to you know, come out and uh, be sincere in their work, be ethical, you know. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult balance, so to speak, in terms of um, enforcing the right kind of practice and also give the people a quiet and calm. Uh, and, you know, sometimes healthcare workers try to um, become a little more aggressive and say, well, we can't work in these conditions unless you give, you know, a lot of protection gadgets and, and maybe the people become supportive. But, you know, all said and done, when the local leaders and the community workers and people like us from, you know, regulatory agencies sit down together and trying to talk through, hopefully, uh, and, and, you know, thankfully so far, we haven't had a big problems in terms of disruption of service or big violence. But I think these things, keep happening because a lot of strain on both sides, the consumer and the provider. And this is where we came in, in, in picture, trying to talk to people, talk to media, do public announcements and give some interviews and trying to convince people through people, not just me or people like us, through you know, the actors and senior people in the community, civic uh, leaders, uh, trying to talk to people that, okay, this is how it is and what government is saying, what the experts are saying right now is right and you got to follow. And I think it takes a lot of effort for common man in country like Nepal to understand this and practice the minimum, basic minimums of public health standards in, in situation like this. So I think it is, uh, it is uh, difficult uh, to get things done the way we want. Uh, but you know, over the last three, four, five months, people seem to understand even at a very low level of villages uh, that this is, uh, this is type of disease, how do you prevent it? How do you pe keep people in quarantine? And so on and so forth. I think we're changing, we're seeing the change that allows us to take some breath now and take time and trying to prepare for a possible outbreak in terms of number of cases. Next. Julia? Yeah, in all said and done, I think, uh, you know, at a personal level, what I do is, is, is carrying the baggage that I have as part of my formal responsibilities. Of course, talk to media, trying to, you know, talk to people, talk to my fellow healthcare workers, my own team, um, you know, work with the hospital leadership on hospital protocols, bring in experts. So all that is you would do, but I think when you say individual contribution, it all comes along with your part of the formal responsibilities. We seriously work with the medical association and other associations, uh, trying to talk to our frontline workers, uh, trying to encourage them and uh, try and mobilize resources for them when there is so much of, of you know, scarce resources in most places now. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, I try to activate the number of NGOs that I work with or I lead some of those to help with supplies or education or research, including one that I'm doing right now to look at the effect of COVID uh, in, in, among the children. 
we've got a few thousand children that got infected and we're trying to look through them in a, in the long run. So these are the things that we try to do. And I think um, we had a pretty tough time to begin with. Are we still uh, having very difficult time? The, the you know, healthcare system is already close to getting stretched, um, but, but uh, um, we're hoping that we can contain it to a reasonable limit that our system does not just collapse and we can survive through this, through this pandemic. But you know, you know, rest is all up to the future, we'll see. Again, we only have one choice, trying to contain it, trying to prevent from spreading it into elderly people and people with chronic conditions. And that's one, one area that I'm seriously working with organizations to trying to give the message to community that even if young people get infected, trying to save the elderly and the people with chronic conditions. So that might be one good strategy for Nepal uh, to minimize the damage. With that, I thank you for giving me this opportunity and having a chance to talk to you all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Kerala. There are two points that, uh, from your talk that I want to, uh, uh, to mention. Uh, the first was you know, the issue of involving leaders outside of the standard hospital and, and, and health system, involving religious leaders, you know, cultural or popular leaders or community leaders. I think that was a very smart move uh, to do that. And, and then the second point I want to bring up is um, the fact that you mentioned you know, sort of uncertainty, confusion, you know, panic in both the community and amongst uh, healthcare workers and how it's a challenge to address that when, you know, you don't have all the data you need because we're used to, especially in the, in the health sector of having the data, having the facts and, and, you know, clearing any confusion just by providing the facts. But when an epidemic is moving so quickly, that can be, be quite difficult. And I think it's really an opportunity for leaders to, to use their emotional intelligence and use an, a more affiliative approach uh, to leadership uh, you know, than the usual sort of command and control uh, form of, of leadership. But certainly it's such a challenge when you have so many different players to coordinate messages and make sure that you get unified messages out there. But thank you so much for your talk. Welcome. So our, thank you. Okay. our next speaker is Mr. Alex Mejia. And Mr. Mejia is a division director of UNITAR and editor in chief of the UN Special Magazine. Mr. Mejia was appointed director of UNITAR's Division for People and Social Inclusion in 2018. And within the division, he serves as senior manager of UNITAR's social development program. And prior to these posts in Geneva, Mr. Mejia served for three years as director of UNITAR's Hiroshima office in Japan, and for four years as director of UNITAR's training center in Atlanta, Georgia. In his current capacity, he serves as director of UNITAR's global network of 19 training centers and within UNITAR's Division for People and Social Inclusion, he's also responsible for UNITAR's Nigeria Project Office. Mr. Mejia is a citizen of Ecuador and his career spans two decades in public and private institutions. In 2001, he became the Vice Minister of Economy for the Republic of Ecuador. And during this period, he served as alternate governor of, to the IMF, the World Bank, and the Inter-American Development Bank, and as a member of the Board of Directors of Ecuador's Central Bank. From 2003 to 2005, he worked in Washington, D.C. as director of the Inter-American Council's Andean Program, which is an entity chartered by the Organization of American States. Mr. Mejia holds a master's in foreign affairs from Georgetown University, a master's degree in business administration from INCAE in Costa Rica, and he also holds a diploma in political leadership from Harvard University. So please, Mr. Mejia. Uh, thank you, Lord Tomtulenko. Uh, just confirm that you can hear me well. Yes. Indeed. And uh, the same uh, appreciation that I would like to express to you and to the rest of our, the participants goes to Dr. Ivelson, my colleague at the UNITA headquarters in Geneva, uh, for bringing um, all these uh, opportunities and these partnerships to us at UNITAR. Um, speaking from the Palais de Nation, uh, here in Geneva, we are just a few blocks away from the WHO, the World Health Organization. And uh, as you will understand, uh, being part of the, the UN system, we have very many colleagues and friends there. And uh, I simply want to put the presentation that you are going to hear in context, especially after uh, listening from experiences from Africa and, and Central Asia and so on, um, is very sad 
to see that in the, the statistics that we follow at the WHO and several other organizations as well, but the official dashboard for us at the UN is the one at WHO. It's about to reach 24 million people infected with COVID and about to reach 900,000 individuals uh, that unfortunately pass away by COVID. This unprecedented challenge has put a strain on leadership. And this is why this webinar is important. Jeff, Dr. Evelson was explaining to me briefly why the need to have this type of conversation uh, is ever present and, and even more now. Um, and, and in trying to understand uh, how to provide leadership in this uh, very difficult, uh, challenging time of the pandemic, when at this moment, and you will all remember that we thought that it would be a couple of months, three months, and you know, back to normal. It's been six months, depending on how you count, eight months or more. And there is still no vaccine uh, ahead. There's still um, several treatments and trials, um, and we remain optimistic. But even uh, if uh, we succeed in finding a definite vaccine before the end of the year, until the administration happens, for the whole of society in our countries, it will be summer of 2022. But I'm speaking to doctors, I'm medical professionals, so I'm really not an expert on issues of um, uh, public health. I am, however, if I may say, an expert on public policy. And when we talk about leadership, in the presentation that I will give you, I want to focus on responsible leadership, because that's the main challenge for me. If you try to define the whole, what is it that is really happening in, in governments now, in the public sector, and particularly in developing nations' governments, there is a challenge on ethical leadership. And it's very difficult, because when you have very limited resources, when people are literally dying, when you as a politician perhaps are under pressure, you get tested, really tested. So let's talk about it. Uh, Julia, please go forward with the presentation that we have and uh, I'll try to, to get into the, the issue now. Very good. So um, before, let me, uh, I have to, uh, to read my boss's, um, uh, of course, um, uh, comments on leadership. Our Secretary General, Antonio Guterres um, has said, well, that, uh, there are as many, uh, uh, as, you, as you know, and this is not from him, but there are so many uh, definitions of leadership. But leadership, in the words of our Secretary General, although can be confined within various terms, in reality is an individual concept. And I want to focus on that. All of us, no matter the level, no matter the institution, no matter the, the context, we all, have, um, we all have to make these individual decisions and our leadership is tested at home, at the operating room, or in a cabinet uh, 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 room in the decision-making that we do. We all possess uh, um, um, an ability to identify the needs uh, in the environment at a particular moment. And also we can build up relational uh, skills and personal traits that will allow us to create influence and trust. Those two are very important. Influence and trust within our teams, our uh, um, uh, brothers, our, our subordinates, our colleagues, and so on. So there is one single vision and one single direction. And this is important. Go to the next one, Julia. Because as you know, the multilateral system and WHO um, at its helm when it comes to public health has been challenged by several governments. Few, uh, by God's grace, is not that many, but uh, the legitimacy of um, the governance of the global health system has been uh, put to the test. And um, there are countries that have said that WHO follows an agenda, that the UN is biased, and that we uh, basically uh, don't have the, the best of the majority, the, the, the welfare of the majority as our uh, premise and ulterior motive. I am uh, here to tell you in a respectful manner that that is not true. When you work for the UN, you work, and particularly at WHO, I would say I admire my colleagues there, you really believe in leadership that is responsible leadership. So let me try to define what is that. There are several definitions. One of them comes from a military uh, person. Don't pay too much attention to it because uh, normally I wouldn't put a, a picture like the one that you see to the right of this slide, but it is important to hear what he said. Before, the Global Compact and EMMD uh, gave us this definition, which is, a, I think, very relevant. The art of motivating, communicating, empowering, and convincing people to engage in a new vision of sustainable development and the necessary change. 
at the end of uh, the day, uh, some people ask me, yeah, but what is really sustainable development? And I always go back to the same answer. It's more than that, but let me oversimplify. The global fight against poverty, period. If you want to do that, you have to ensure these sustainable approaches in which uh, economic issues are important, social issues are important, environmental issues are important, and so on. But it is that to inflict, to affect that change, the fight against poverty must remain a priority. Now to the right, to the perhaps um, uh, delicate or delicate citation here, but I believe again, is very relevant. Leadership is a potent combination of strategy and character. Please remember those two, strategy and character. And uh, this is the phrase that I like the most. But if you must be without one of them, be without strategy. What does it mean? That your character, you as individual, myself, who I am, who I really am, my identity, my core of who I am, will determine my leadership style. It is the case. And it happens to doctors, it happens to lawyers, it happens to politicians, it happens to teachers, it happens to everyone. But it's very important to remember that if for whatever reason the strategy is failing, as some people say uh, in the fight against the pandemic, is the strategy is to be reviewed or you don't have one. Character is what will guide you. Next. Here, um, a definition of irresponsible leadership is important to remember in this pandemic. Behaviors conducted and decisions made by organizational leaders that are illegal and or violate moral standards. And that's where the nitty gritty comes to be. Because some people that I have met in my career have told me, but it is not illegal. But then the answer is yes, it's legal, but it's unethical or is uh, very, very difficult to defend it morally. So uh, uh, that's at the center of a definition of responsible leadership and what is irresponsible leadership. So whoever imposes processes and structures that promote an ethical conduct by followers is indeed an irresponsible leader, and there are very many. Next. Now, um, why do we need responsible leaders? I think the answer is pretty obvious, but please entertain me. Leaders have both power and potential to contribute to the betterment of the world. A multitude of stakeholders claim and necessitate mutually beneficial relationships that emanate from responsible leadership. There are new demands on leaders. The complexity of interconnected and intercultural environments, diversity of interests and needs of multiple stakeholders. And responsible leaders constantly work to build the capacities of their organization to learn, to change culture and to adapt to trends. Here, I'm going to take just a little while to read you a couple of, uh, more than a couple of sentences, but you'll see why, on introducing a concept of ethical leadership. Responsible leadership, as you just heard, implies um, sound life principles, moral values, and an ethical approach. Uh, Mr. Greg Sableton, uh, Mr. Peter Schroeder, and uh, Ms. Daniela Popa wrote an article a couple of years back entitled Global Health Ethics. Um, uh, introduction to prominent theories and relevant topics. And they say in part of this article, I'm going to quote now, global health ethics is a relatively new term that is used to conceptualize the process of applying moral value to health issues that are typically characterized by a global level effect or require action coordinated at a global level. The pandemic that we are going through is indeed an excellent example of why we need to conceptualize this type of process based on moral values. They say, it is important to acknowledge that this account of global ethics takes a predominantly geographic approach, geographic, and that's another problem. Because in the 21st century, country boundaries, regional boundaries, province, provincial boundaries, city boundaries, the, the borders of uh, our uh, uh, circumscriptions are becoming more and more irrelevant. So even though we still, and I'm speaking from the UN, and we as a multilateral institution understand that there are several many actors that are sovereign within a particular territories. We also believe in polylateralism, polylateralism in which not only governments, not only member states interact amongst themselves, but that there is a global system and particularly a global health system in which yes, national ministries of health uh, the global international architecture, the WHO at the hand, but very many other entities interact with individuals, with NGOs, 
with foundations, with private donors and so on that have an ability to impact what happens. So let me go back to global health ethics. Um, we uh, have two questions that perhaps uh, uh, need to be uh, uh, mentioned here. And uh, one is what is the moral significance of health? Let me repeat it. What is the moral significance of health? Why is it so important and so morally important? Why in this fight against poverty, health is at the forefront? Health and education, if I may say, both is the moral grounding that we have. And second, as what I was just implying, what is the moral significance of boundaries, of borders? Because for a pandemic, there is almost no borders. So in the 21st century, we see that in Nepal or in an African country or in Ecuador, my, my own country, no matter how much you have prepared to put barriers for this virus to enter, we still ended up getting it. I remember late February, early March, when several governments say we have done all what it takes and we will have it under control. It didn't happen. If you look at the map, I have the map from the beginning of March and the map from the beginning of this month. It didn't happen. So boundaries, borders are indeed uh, perhaps irrelevant now. But let me go back to the presentation and just to wrap up uh, uh, next, uh, Julia. I wanted to introduce this concept of moral uh, leadership and ethical leadership. Um, uh, and why do we need it? Because in the 21st century, the challenges, uh, the COVID being just one of them, there are many others, require responsible leadership. And it has always been required. But if there is a moment in which it is required the most, is now, it's urgent, imperative. Next. Here, uh, you see, uh, uh, Julia, if you can advance it, yes. Um, that uh, if I can give you the, the little commercial before I wrap up. Um, we have the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. This does not belong to the UN. The UN was the facilitator of the process to adopt them in September 2015, and now the custodian and the organization that does the monitoring and evaluation and so on on each one of the, uh, the, the implementation of each one of these 17 goals. But the Sustainable Development Goals, the number one, and the spirit that permeates the rest is the global fight against poverty. So we believe that the poor, that are suffering the most during the pandemic needs to remain a priority. They have, unfortunately, and I don't have the time to get into the detail, uh, uh, backslided. Uh, there are many governments that cannot invest as they used to in uh, social welfare, social uh, safety nets, and social programs. It's a pity because they continue to be necessary so as to guarantee, again, health and education at the minimum level to the poorest of the poor. Next, please. And here, this is a perhaps an oversimplified picture of what is sustainable development. Is this balance, this is the interconnection in, in, amongst the economic, the social and environmental uh, public policy realm. How we ensure that all of them are there, not only economic, not only social, not only environmental. Next, please. And I think this is the last, um, uh, SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, goal number 16, uh, entitled Peace, Justice, and Strong Institutions, called for um, the following as part of the 2030 Agenda. It uh, recognizes the need to build peaceful, just, and inclusive societies that provide equal access to justice and good governance at all levels on uh, transparent, effective, and accountable uh, governance of institutions. So when we talk about the global health or public health, and leadership, we have to remember that if there is no institutionality, the right type of institutions in a government, it doesn't work. I have been a member of a cabinet, a, a great privilege for me, and I have been a career diplomat, and I have seen in very many countries where I have been based, that if it depends on personal leadership, no matter how good the leader, at a point in time, sooner or later, it will all come crumble down because the institutions are the ones that uh, stay. People come and go, no matter if it is two years or 20 years, but we are not eternal. So we need to strengthen institutions to make sure that we build peaceful and inclusive societies. Goal 16, as I say, specifically calls for effective, accountable and inclusive institution at all levels, national level or federal level, subnational level, departments, provinces, states, and local level 
cities, um, uh, townships, uh, communities, and the like. Implementing SDG 16 must be approached from the side of transforming rather than just developing institutions. And that's rather new. Many people, even in Exeter, are still talking, myself included until recently, of developing, sustainable development, as I just say. But it's more than that. It's a transformation that requires the right leadership, an ethical, moral leadership. Next, please. So, um, the competing values and challenges of leadership roles in the public sector, uh, as I have said, uh, public sector leaders are being asked to function with few, fewer resources while continually finding new ways to tackle challenges. Leadership in the public sector is especially important. It not only influences the job performance and satisfaction of employees, but also how government and public agencies perform. Leadership is critical to effective public governance, including progressive planning, efficiency, transparency, and accountability. Public sector leaders also face different challenges than in the private sectors, and perhaps call on different competencies. Uh, the next one, I, I believe, I, or this is the last one. Thank you. Um, uh, I want to say something uh, in concluding, because I'm not going to, to read all of that. You have it on the screen. Uh, but you can uh, see how the challenges of leadership for healthcare professionals apply, and you are experts on that, I'm not. So I don't want to embarrass myself. Let me just uh, instead tell you something. Uh, and this is my last comment. Um, I believe that if there is a um, public official to be admired, that public official belongs to the health system of a country, the public health system. Yes, the teachers are to be admired. Yes the people working in security are to be admired and appreciated and so on and so forth. But there is one person, that one person, that nurse, that doctor, that uh, uh, laboratorian and so on, that actually makes a difference between life and death. Those are the health professionals. And leadership is tested even more every day with every single patient. So to all of you that belong to that sector and on behalf of the United Nations, our sincere appreciation my respect. And thanks again, uh, Jeff, for bringing to us this very unique webinar that I have enjoyed listening to so much. Thank you. Back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Mr. Mejia. And I especially appreciate the fact that you mentioned the moral standards, because I think that was really brought to the fore in leadership during COVID. And just to give you know some examples from the U.S., issues of hospitals not allowing healthcare workers to wear their own personal protective equipment, even when the hospital wasn't able to provide any for them. Uh, health workers being fired for raising concerns about safety, even though they, they raise these concerns through appropriate channels. So it looked like retaliation. And then also leaders giving themselves bonuses at the same time that they were either laying off staff or putting staff on furlough. It sort of raises a lot of these moral issues. And I think that some hospitals and health systems will take a, a lot of time to regain that trust and that, uh, that moral leadership. So thanks so much for, for sharing that. So Thank our next and, and, and final speaker is Anna Liu. And Anna Liu is a nurse with over 25 years of clinical and nursing leadership experience. And Ms. Liu has a degree from Flinders University in Australia and also received training in the KK Women's and Children's Hospital in Singapore. And she has worked across many different um, types of nursing, including leadership, PICU, um, and surgical uh, nursing. And um, she's been the um, chief nursing officer in the Qingdao United um, uh, Hospital Nursing. In, in China and is currently working in the emergency department at the Beijing United Hospital. And so Ms. Liu will be able to talk about nursing leadership during the COVID crisis, as well as give the Chinese perspective on leadership during COVID. So Ms. Liu. Okay, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, this one for be here. Uh, yeah. uh, my topic is nursing emergency managers through the COVID-19. As we know, the COVID virus uh, outbreak in Wuhan during the Spring Festival. Then uh, at that time, it's quickly uh, spread to whole, uh, the, all over the country, uh, the China, and even spread it to the world. Uh, so, but I, I don't have any chance to went to the Wuhan to uh, work in the front line to get the, this business. Uh, my 
experience is our hospital. We did not hospital how to handle this COVID. So this the picture is show this our hospital. Uh, Beijing United Family Hospital is international private hospital, uh, which built in 20 years ago by American woman. So until uh, until now, we have the seven hospitals over the China and the dozen of the satellite clinic uh, after 23 years developed. So this is the main building in Beijing. So next, please. Next slide. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so the challenging we faced through the COVID, like all the other hospital phases, we shut off the staff. Uh, as we know, there's the Spring Festival in China. Uh, that's a big festival. So half of our hospital staff take the ho took the holiday. Uh, even some the foreign doctor near our hospital went to overseas back to hometown. So until right now, we still have some foreigner cannot make back to Beijing. So um, this is really the first challenge, the big challenge for us. As you know, in uh, during the COVID, uh, we have a lot of restriction measures from the national level. So our hospital revenue also decreased. We in the first three months of the COVID our revenue decreased about uh, 50% uh, because the national school is all closed down. The foreign company, the staff cannot make back to China, so the volume of the patient is really decreased. Um, the, you know, the, the, the PPE, the material and the disinfection um, is uh, Actually, in our hospital, we are not really faces this problem because uh, our central supply is staff is you know quite powerful. They purchase uh, from the the world. Uh, the office can manage uh, you know the stock stock storage for us, but. Uh, at that time, we're not sure how long this uh, PPE, especially the native file, can last. So we, we, the staff is quite worried about this issue. Mm, then also, the staff, this the COVID is a new disease. We are really fear about that because they are fear about the spread to disease to family, to friends, even the transport. So then our hospital is a small private hospital. Uh, you know, in China, we experienced a SARS in 2003, but we're still not very prepared for the, you know, this big panic, pan, uh, pandemic in, in Beijing. So um, we lock up the, some the protocol process also, our hospital the layout is not um, reasonable for screening and the fewer patients. So our negative, uh, negative room also, you know, uh, not sufficient. We only have the four negative room for, you know, for isolation patients. So next. Thank you. Yeah. So, but in this uncertain time, our nurse and leader uh, decided to uh, cope with the sort of the staff. We called back the nurse from the, you know, who are on the holiday. Mm, they, we, we immediately called him back, you know, his, uh, his continue there the holiday. Then for the current staff, we, we not permit them to take the annual leave. Uh, actually, this is quite stress for them. But at that time, we have no other choice, so we, we made this decision. Uh, then we, uh, we also established some of the nursing pool. This is the nursing pool. We recruited some of the nurses who are quite experienced to uh, handle the complicated case, very skilled for the IV. So we we accelerate the crew is in order to, uh, you know, they can work the overtime. Then we also decided uh, 
uh, half hired nurses to take part in front front line work. That means the head nurse will need go to field work clinic, the pulmonary department to work with the nurses to easy them to you know the fear also be model for the nurses. So next please. Next slide, please. Yeah. Then that you know our hospital is private hospital. As we mentioned, as I mentioned before, our revenue is decreased. We have to uh, you know to make money for sustain hospital the operation. So uh, after nursing team uh, after nursing team will be talk with the upper administrator, we decide we still, you know, uh, stick on the selected case. We never cancel the one single case we scheduled on. Also in, in Beijing, in the big public hospital, uh, as the policy and the upper health bureau, uh, uh, the request, the most large public hospital do not uh, uh, do not take you know the schedule the selected case uh, in some uh, um, chemotherapy. Uh, most of most of the public hospital uh, stop serving this. Our hospital decide to take all the chemi uh, chemotherapy uh, patient uh, neuro cancer uh, who need the surgery so we our the operation room the all of it is you know available for who needed this so that's why we have to meet out the uh, the OR nurse available uh, our OR nurse uh, there is separate two group that will be you know work yeah highly workload for them they work a lot the overtime so then at uh, that time, our, we have the set lab clinic. We have the seven set clinic in Beijing. So we decided to close uh, three uh, set lab clinic so we can deploy the nurse back to main hospital and to support the two, you know, have a workload the department. So next three. Uh, then, you know, for the PPE, even when they didn't really uh, shortage of the PPE, that we still feel very cautious to, to use that. So we assigned one senior nurse, uh, the head nurse, to manage and plan how to use the PPE. So uh, this senior nurse decides uh, which department need how many in 95, which department only need a surgical mask. Because at that time, the nurses and the other staff were really fear of this coverage. Some people even wear the true uh, surgical mask. So then some of the nurses and doctors uh, wear the inside the 95, then outside they call the surgical mask. So uh, we, we worried about issues than this. So we added the issue there, then the head nurse will be uh, keep record. Then also, you know, they set a strictly time how long can change the N95. We normally require the staff nurse to change every four hours for the surgical whenever whether it's red or you know the, the surge, they can change any time. But for the N95, uh, we are fed strictly to 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 ask them to use this the scientifically and efficiently. Next, please. So uh, for the communication, we hold more than a uh, huddle, so then share the, uh, the information op openly. Uh, in our hospital, we use a lot the WeChat. In China, it's quite popular. So whatever we got the morning uh, huddle, we will spread it all the information to the WeChat group, like the, you know, the front line nurses to know the update that they change when the physician, uh, our hospital, uh, our the nursing manager team to decide. Then for the for the easy, there are the anxiety, the nurse anxiety and uh, fear. 
uh, we managed uh, 43 online training the, the Zoom. So uh, we teach them how to use uh, how to wear the PPE, how to kick the off PPE. Uh, in the fever clinic, actually, uh, we always send two nurses. One is senior nurses, another is junior nurses. So they will be watching each other to how to wear the PPE, uh, how to take off the PPE, uh, how to you know do the uh, hand washing, the hygiene measure. We did very detailed issue because the staff really worry when in the closed environment, uh, they they you know, easy to you know uh, afraid to infect by this virus. Then we also uh, doing the screening very strictly. Uh, we update our screening protocol uh, very timely because since this uh, it is out of reach. Uh, our uh, specialist in China issued eight version of the guideline of the covered PPE. So we timely to constantly change our the, uh, protocol of the screening. So um, the travel history is is very strictly to change. Okay, the, the, to ask. Then we also ask our senior staff to share the SARS experience because we do have some of the nurses who experienced the SARS in 2003. Uh, this include me. I had been you know, working in the uh, local hospital in 2003. So we use our personal story to share with our younger nurses to ease the, the uh, fear. Then gradually they will be, you know, to, to, to relax. Then also in our hospital, we provide psychology consult consultation. If this nurse is really afraid, you know, we, we ask, you know, consultation, the psychologist uh, consultation, they also will uh, uh, let this nurse back off the front line working. So this can, you know, to, to, to make sure that the mental health is uh, well. Next, please. So uh, uh, this just above we mentioned is just the uh, detail, you know, we, we deal this uh, covered. So whether we are prepared or not, this I think is the long term for the leadership, how to do the computer plan, how to do the, uh, you know, the hand hygiene, how to do the uh, public health education, it's really long term. We, 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 I think for, you know, in China, we experience SARS and the COVID will be better, you know, to develop the, the this, the, uh, all the computer plan. So actually in the Beijing, we, in two days ago, we all cleared all the COVID, uh, the patient, because uh, as we well know, we have the second wave of the COVID occurred in Beijing in June. In June, yeah, after almost two months, all the patients discharged. In the second day, we don't have the, uh, any patient die from this disease. Uh, this picture is show, uh, the second one is me, you know, we, we're working in the front line to, to take care of our covered patient. But I think uh, in our hospital, uh, I think uh, gradually all people are very calm. So they are, you know, they easy to to care, to, to take care of themselves, and uh, even the short of they work over time. Then plus, um, if you know, we we nurses it's quite great to you know bring the uh, virus back to their home. Our hospital also you know uh, prepare the accommodation for them. Uh, if they don't want to go home to with uh, and family, they also provide accommodation for the nurses. Uh, we um, another your know, board. Uh, thank you, dear, the uh, contribution. They give the special allowance for them. Yeah. So this uh, money is not very you know big issue for them, but it is encouraging them, that appreciate them, appreciate what they done for our hospital. So. Thank you. This all my yeah the presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, giving this opportunity to speak on this conference. Thank you.
Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Liu. I especially appreciated what you said about having the senior nurses tell their SARS experiences to the more junior nurses and you know, encouraging that, that mentorship and that type of leadership and also doing leadership through storytelling, which is in a way what, uh, what that practice was. I also think it was very important uh, what you said about the head nurses actually working at the front line, because I think this has two important uh, effects. One is it shows the solidarity that the senior nurses are actually willing to, you know, go out there and, and take the health risks, you know, with, uh, you know, their frontline nurses and aren't, you know, hiding in their, their offices where it's safe. And the other is the senior nurses will, will learn so much and see what the real problems are because, you know, as Professor Fall was, you know, pointing out uh, in, his le in his talk, problems are gold. And sometimes leadership doesn't truly understand what the problem but when the leadership goes to the front line, it becomes quite uh, apparent what the, what the problems are. They can then address them. Uh, so I was wondering, as we, we go into our discussion and, and, and question and answer session, if you could talk a little bit more about what effect you think uh, the, the senior nurses, the leadership nurses being on the front line had uh, to leadership uh, you know, in your hospital and to nursing in your hospital. I think you're muted. Yeah, maybe unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, this uh, mistake. Uh, for the foreign nurses, the head is the especially the head nurse be there. It's really encouraging the you know the younger nurses. Uh, uh, from for example, when I appear in the front line, I work there. They're really you know uh, happy. And in fact, they never expected, actually, they never expected the senior, uh, like the rank, uh, the, the high rank like me can be in the front line. And also, as you mentioned, as a senior nurse, we really, uh, we can see the different as package. You know, we can see really different what the whole of the process, uh, what the, uh, this uh, necessary, this the big risk for example, uh, if the process not smoothly for the nurses for the whole, you know, uh, from the screening, take care of patient, transfer patient, we can see the difference in package. Then we got the, uh, from the first hand of the information, then we can make a decision how to fix this problem and how to, you know, uh, plan, do, the action to make this whole procedure and the process better. Then also as the leader of nursing present, we can delay all the information to the upper administration. If the junior nurse or the younger nurse, they need to not, they have the low voice to speak for issue and problem direct to the upper management level. So, uh, I think that's very important because, you know, we, we, we find the problem, I have to stop this problem. Uh, the walls from the us, from the head nurse or chief uh, nurse director, yeah, they can listen from our big balls. So this I uh, personally uh, thought. Great, well, thank you so much. And the, the next question I have is for all of our speakers. The Center for Creative Leadership, which is a leadership think tank and training center based in North Carolina, published a white paper on leadership during COVID. And they talked about how, you know, we need to go from the crisis management or the firefighting that Professor Fall mentioned and move to a more transformative and resiliency type of leadership and an innovative leadership if you know, institutions are going to be able to survive. So for any of our speakers, you know, how do you think or what would transformative and resilience leadership look like going forward in your institution or some of the institutions that you've worked with? If I may uh, take that question. Uh, I think it's going, how the leadership is going to be uh, moving forward. It's going to change a lot, I believe. It's been already changing uh, drastically in the last decade plus because of social media, because of the interconnectedness of people and uh, how the flow of information goes. Uh, remember that information is power. 
you know, several people have said that, and I tend to agree. Because if you don't know, then you know you are comfortable uh, uh, in ignorance. If you know, you have two options: to continue to be comfortable or to challenge. And um, we see that the level of challenge, uh, challengers and challenging that happens to leaders, not only politically, but in every setting, um, institutionally, uh, uh, at, even at the families, uh, intergenerational issues and so on, uh, is in crescendo. So I believe that the leadership uh, is uh, being reshaped, that the characteristics, the traits, the skills of a new leader are going to be a little different from what they were only one or two decades ago, not to mention the, the last part of the last century. And um, one of the things that will happen, and, and I need to talk on fake news, very, very uh, shallow, in, in a shallow manner. Um, fake news uh, requires that uh, credibility becomes even more of an asset. Uh, uh, people will think the contrary that because now it's fake news and if you say a little white lie over here, you are a leader, you are exposed and so on, you know, you can always say it's fake news and you go back to it. No, I, I don't believe so. I believe that because of, um, uh, you know, the issue of truth becoming kind of relative when it's not, uh, uh, the issue of truth uh, being challenged in that way as you speak, the leaders of the future and the leaders that are in think on the other before themselves. So leadership is changing, is being challenged, and new skills required. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you. So Professor Fall, would you want to, to comment on that question? Yeah, thank you, Kate. Uh, I've been working in a research project over the last two or three years, uh, along with the Catalysis Group in the United States, uh, particularly looking at, at leadership at facility level. So we're not dealing with people who are essentially working with policy or strategy, but actual operations. And the core question we've put is that the person should say to themselves, what do I need to do to become the leader of an organization filled with problem solvers. So immediately that person's got to realize they cannot be the problem solver. What in their behavior would cause their organization to become one filled with problem solvers? And then this sort of contradiction or, or paradox that there needs to be a, a strong commitment to the consistent use of agreed best practice and at the same time, questioning those practices in the belief that there is a better way. And so that, that kind of paradox is about driving organizations which are clear about their purpose and building a commitment to, to pursue that relentlessly. But with leadership that is, um, it, it is present and doesn't regard itself as the know-all. I love that. I love the concept of an organization filled with problem solvers. That, that same Center for Creative Leadership uh, report warned against the, the concern that the COVID crisis could drive codependency and with employees sort of uh, adopting a position of, of helplessness and expecting the institution to, to solve all the problems. And, and your answer uh, sort of speaks to that, uh, that risk. Uh, do either of the other uh, speakers want to address the question? So the, the next question I have is uh, another, oh, sorry, yes. Yeah, well, I guess uh, I can only add one sentence to what uh, Professor Paul said. Trying to build the new information and the new evidence into the fundamental building blocks. Trying to make a routine of what you have, get back to basics. I think that's the only way to become resilient. I mean, you can't be on top of heels all the time. So back to basics with the new information, you have new practices you thought was was right to do in this time. Great advice, thank you. And then the, the last question that I have is the COVID crisis has also been unique in that because it was a global crisis, high income countries could not give the type of assistance to low and middle income countries that they normally would during such a crisis. And so 
uh, low and middle income countries really had to rely on their own leadership and own resources and actually were quite successful, especially compared to some high income countries and in, in their response to COVID. So I was wondering what you think this newfound confidence, how it might affect uh, you know, what goes on in global health leadership and the relationship uh, between donors and low and middle income countries. Yeah, who do you want this question to be directed to? Uh, anyone who uh, feels they uh, they want to address the issue. Well, we can from we can start from the least developed, so I can I can take that first. Yes, please. Well, that's that's definitely a concern, and looks like everybody seems to be struggling at the, at least for this for six months. And um, but you know, I tend to take this in a positive note that the world we'll see health and um, the infectious disease and, and you know, a pandemic like this reiterates the concept of interdependence and the value of all working together, number one. Number two, health will get a more focus, new, um, new look, new visit to, to um, you know, to, to the realization that everybody has to work uh, for each other otherwise we're going to get into something like this again so i think it will open eyes of those who are not taking international health seriously um, and hopefully that will bring back some of the assistance into the ones that, which are weakest great thank you and does anyone else want to address that question okay we actually have a, a question on uh, on nurses and uh, uh, so for Mrs. Uh, Liu, um, how you address the downtime uh, from nurses either that were exposed to COVID or actually tested positive for COVID? Yeah, I, I saw this question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in our hospital, we didn't might any, you know, the nurses who have, who have the uh, positive disease of COVID, but we did have the plan for whoever had this disease. Uh, after they clear by hospital, uh, uh, you know, then also in our hospital, we have to do the, the test, I did three times, then did some the blood test. If this all clear, we normally request treatment days. We are back to the hospital, it's just our uh, continued plan. Uh, then also I can, uh, consult with uh, some micro, uh, the classmates who work in the Yitai hospital. Uh, this uh, government design the hospital is special, uh, special to take care of the COVID patient. Uh, they they have the same the protocol to to you know up to uh, twenty one days. Uh, I know in the in the I think in the one of the hospital, they have the emergency nurse uh, complex of the COVID. Uh, then after that, there's a whole emergency department, uh, the lockdown. They close uh, this uh, emergency department in that hospital. Then after 14 days, they bring back all the staff, then they open the emergency. So for, for our plan, it's the 21 days. Great. Well, thank yeah, you so much. Yeah. the request for us to, to post the uh, study that I mentioned, the white paper. So I'll send that link to Julia and she can uh, distribute it to everyone who registered. So Jeff, do you want to give some closing remarks to the webinar? Yes. Well, thank you very much, Kate. And thank you to all of the uh, participants for joining us. And a special thank you to all the speakers. This has been very interesting. And I just wanted to touch on one point. Uh, it really came out in Anna's talk, and Kate, you highlighted it, about how the chief nurses went to the front lines. And I think really, as we look at ourselves as leaders, this concept of a servant leader being the, the strongest message we can send to the people that we are responsible to lead is the take home message here. And that builds an environment and a, a culture of coming together as a team. And I, I re always remember early on in my years, the, the, uh, 
description of a leader is someone who will get a group of people to accomplish a task. And at the end of that task, that group of people say, we did it ourselves. And the leader can actually stand back and say, good for you. And doesn't have to be out front waving their own flag saying, look what I did as a leader. So this concept of a servant leader is so important. And I, I, I always remember one of my senior mentors as a, as a, when I was training as a resident, he's the chief, one of the chief surgeons. Between cases, he pitched in and helped the cleaning staff clean the OR rooms between cases. And that struck a chord with me as being a, a real example of being a servant leader. And so as we move forward into this new era of COVID and the challenges in, of, within the chaos that we face, I think it's important for us all to remember to, to be those leaders like, like those examples that we have. So I just want to say thank you again to all of the uh, speakers, wonderful topics, uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, from the United Nations Institute for Training and Research here in Geneva, Switzerland, and the Global Surgery Foundation, I want to thank Operation Smile and all the participants who made this webinar possible. Thank you very much to all of you and keep safe and uh, check our website in the next uh, couple of days because the video will be up uh, and uh, available to those um, who are interested and uh, look forward to the next webinar together. So thank you very much. Keep safe and uh, God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a wonderful Thank day. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.